This is APR Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. And welcome to the Aerial Phenomenon Investigation Team's podcast, Case Files. API Case Files provides an opportunity to examine and discuss reports and observations of unidentified aerial phenomena and the associated interests surrounding the study of that phenomenon. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API's Chief of Investigations and your host for this March 2014 episode. On this program, API's Deputy Director Paul Carr discusses with a skeptic the philosophical approach of skepticism as it regards UFOs and attending phenomenon. With UFOs, um, it seems to me that there's no theoretical reason why ET entities couldn't be here. In this episode, we'll present Part 1. Next episode, we'll conclude with Part 2. We think you'll enjoy listening in on the conversation... Paul Carr will also offer his latest musings on unidentified science, this time regarding the problems of eyewitness testimony and the need for corroboration. And on this episode, I'll talk with founder and director Antonio Paris about his brand new book, Space Science. My main goal for the book is to shape and force the UFO community to come up with better arguments for their hypothesis that some of these UFOs are extraterrestrial. All that and more on this episode of API Case Files. Thank you for joining us. This is API Case Files. Case Files. Since this is API Case Files, I figured I'd give a report update on cases so far in 2014. We're averaging three cases a week. Taking, for example, just the first 30 cases that have come in in 2014, I find that eight of the people filing a report did not want an investigation, whereas 15 did, and seven didn't care one way or the other. Again, taking into account only the first 30 cases of this year, we investigated 12 of the 15 who did want an investigation. Of these investigations, the findings thus far show a range of explanations from simple pareidolia, where a witness claims to have seen unusual faces and figures in a common cirrostratus cloud, to aircraft lights accounting for unusual lights in the sky, to undetermined, to unidentified, and to most probably a man-made object. Many cases are still in the investigative cycle, and no determination has yet been made. Investigator Ray Nuvalone is finishing up an interesting Close Encounters case. Investigator Nancy Dotty is working a new case. Our UK investigator Lawrence McNeil is almost done with one of his two active cases. Paul Carr is in the midst of two active cases, one in far-flung Patagonia, and a New York sighting in which he's training one of our newest investigators, Ed Germino. We have another new team member, John Hilton, who has just taken on a case in New York, and Antonio Paris is working a New York sighting case. I'm wrapping up a good case in California, one in which the witness actually had video, and I'm also in the midst of an ongoing sightings case in Cedro Woolley, Washington. I also just took on an exceedingly intriguing case that I want to go into depth on here. Case 14027AN4. The witness, Michael, has had a close UFO sighting and several other high strangeness encounters that merit some consideration, I feel. As you listen to our podcast this episode, you will be presented with differing views on the UFO enigma. Do we, as investigators, as researchers, dare study and examine, in addition, the odd paranormal occurrences that seem to sometimes accompany UFO encounters? Can a planetary scientist who has had no anomalous experiences 
keep an open mind when encountering those who claim they have? Can a skeptic realign his thinking, yet stay discerning even after his own woo-woo experience? Can an investigator stay grounded and scientific, following experiences of high strangeness? Everyone involved in this podcast feels there are mainly questions and few answers to be had at this juncture. Forming better questions and hoping for reliable evidence and firm data, that's the quest. I, for one, approach the subject this way. There is an old parable where three blind men, who have never encountered an elephant, are allowed to touch one part of that elephant. One touches the tree trunk-like leg, one the skinny, wispy tail, and the third the articulated, malleable trunk of the elephant. All three came away with three distinct separate understandings of the exact same animal. They each had an encounter that was accurate and factual, yet all three came away with a different experience of the same beast. The beast we face is so multifaceted as to be off the scale of human understanding, and yet we encounter and we question, and we search, and we try to bend our minds enough to touch some part of it to understand the beast. That brings me to case 14027AN4, the 27th case of this year, an anomalous experience 4 out of a possible 5, told here by the witness Michael. A high strangeness case experienced by two individuals during a mundane, routine road trip. They had zero skin pores, zero hair. Their skin was fake, I mean, for lack of better words. It was like a weird, like, rubber. To, honestly, to this day, I've really never seen anything, any type of material that could really describe what their skin was like. You know, I'm sorry when I talk about this. It's, it's a weird experience for me because for years I've thought about this time and time again. But when I had watched uh, the video... There was no doubt in my mind what he was telling was the truth. Almost identical in the characteristics of these of these men, you know, that weren't human, whatever they are. I mean, knowing what I experienced and hearing that, I mean, my heart sunk. That was Michael, who will soon be relating an extraordinary experience he had in 2001. But what triggered his contact with API was how it related so startlingly to case 2012-001. The case was of a large triangular craft that flew low over a hotel on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls in October 2008. During subsequent interviews with the witness, he mentioned that as a result of his first report to news media in the area right after the sighting, his workplace was visited by straight out of Hollywood central casting Men in Black, and they were looking for him. He just didn't happen to be at work that day. In fact, he related that the hotel lobby surveillance cameras happened to actually record their entry into the hotel. I produced a short video of that and in January 2013 uploaded it to the Coast to Coast website. It's gotten a lot of airplay. Now, fast forward to this month, March 2014. We get a report from a young man who saw that video and felt he finally knew someone else had experienced the strange, plastic, fake human beings he encountered in 2001. I've been looking for similar stories for the last 10 years, you know, and that's, you know, I... You know, sometimes I sometimes I do better than others with, you know, sometimes I could go a month or two without really thinking about it, maybe three months. But I know what I experienced, and it's, I got to be honest with you, I mean, it's, it was a terrifying situation. We had stopped and we had pulled off this freeway into a, you know, the uh, the little mini mart was on this road that was parallel to the uh, 8 freeway. So when we pulled up, I had uh, noticed some military vehicles, uh, a couple Humvees and some troop carriers. And they were just, uh, they were parked 
to the side of the mini mart. So they weren't fueling. They were all parked right next to each other. And I thought it was pretty cool. I always love seeing military vehicles on the freeway and in transport and stuff. And, you know, uh, my dad was an army intelligence officer and so was my grandfather. And so I actually grew up on, uh, on base in Fort Carson, Colorado. So whenever I saw military guys, I was always interested to see, you know, what unit they were out of or what they were doing and maybe make small talk or, you know, along at that time too, I was actually thinking about joining the army myself. So, but we parked at a pump and uh, my friend Ryan had stayed at the car and I was just going to run in and get us something to drink and maybe some snacks. And I walked in and there was probably, uh, you know, nine guys, I believe I counted nine, and they were all standing in a single file line, and um, I, I didn't think anything when I walked in. In fact, the first thing I thought to do was just to look at their uh, their patches, see what unit they were out of, because I, I wasn't familiar with any Army base out of, uh, you know, the San Diego area. I mean, there's Naval, there's Marines, and Oceanside, and couldn't really think of an Army base, so I was kind of curious to see what their patches and units were, and I was looking, I didn't see anything. I thought that was really strange. And then I was trying to look for a branch. Usually they have, you know, U.S. Army or Navy on the uh, left breast pocket. And I didn't see anything. And I thought, huh, that's kind of weird. And then I noticed they had their covers on too. You know, typically military guys will never wear their covers indoors. And I thought that was strange. And I just thought, huh, maybe they're just like new recruits or this is some, you know, ROTC program. I, I didn't know what it was. It just seemed really odd to me. So I walked to the back and, you know, I grabbed um, a couple Gatorades and, and some beef jerky. And I was, uh, I just got into line right behind these guys. And they were literally, the place was so small that, and they were standing so close to each other that I had to get in line. And I was basically wedged between a, a fridge door and, and them or the last guy in line. And uh, as I was standing there and I was kind of looking over their shoulder, over this guy's shoulder. And I thought, my God, they're all like the same size and height. And right then I, I happened to look at the back of this guy's head. Um, he was clean shaven. I didn't see any hair at all. Right. I looked at the back of this guy's head and it just hit me. There was, there was like zero pores to his skin, you know, but what stood out even more was the fact that the, te- the, the texture of the skin, like the, the tone, it didn't look like a skin tone. It, it looked almost like um, like one of my daughter's Barbie dolls, you know, where they can't just get the skin color quite right, and it looked rubbery. When I noticed this, it just hit me, and then I looked over this guy's shoulder again, and every one of them was the same. My heart started racing, and I was like, this isn't right, because, you know, um, this guy does not look human. And as these guys are checking out and walking out, even when it came to the cashier and they're putting these gallons of water up there, you know, she would just say, you know, 109, 109, you know, and they would just you know, pull out $2, put it down on the table, grab their change, put it back in their pocket and move along. It was, I mean, it was almost like watching something to repeat. It was like pulling the same cash out of the same pocket, turning and walking out the same way. I was standing in the back and I was holding these things. And I, when I started to freak out and wonder like, what is going on here? What are these guys? I walked to the front, they had um, like a gum pack at the cashier. And I just grabbed some gum. I was really just trying to find a reason to get to the front and then turn back around and walk past these guys again. So I went to the front, walked, you know, grabbed a gum pack, turned back around. And this time, instead of, you know, trying to look for unit patches and, you know, branches and everything else that I was looking for the first time, I wanted to look at their faces. And they all had the same identical faces, the same features, the same everything. There, there was nothing different. Uh, they were the same identical person, all of them, and uh, no hair. And their covers, you know, their caps were pulled so low that I, I couldn't get a look at their eyes. I wasn't even really trying to make contact. I was just trying to look at their faces, and not one of them turned their head to look at me. Not one of them was looking down. I mean, they were all like single file line, almost like they were in pause or something. And as these guys are checking out and walking out, none of them are saying a word to the cashier. I put my stuff down. I walked outside before I could even make it to the car. My friend Ryan said, what's wrong? And I must have had a look on my face. And I just told Ryan, I said, hey, um, dude, you need to go in there and 
come back out, tell me if you see anything wrong. And he started walking away from me, and I said, hey, Ryan. And he turned around, and I said, be observant. Ryan probably spent 20 seconds in there before he walked back out. And, uh, you know, he came pretty much jogging to the car, and he was like, what are those guys? Are they human? You know, and uh, I didn't know really what to think. I was really spooked. To be honest with you, you probably hear it in my voice, even when I talk about it. It's a very strange experience I had. And uh, to this day, I don't know what these guys were, but they were not human. I was freaked out. I had never seen anything like that before. And then my friend Ryan, he was freaked out. I mean, he was like trembling. He was so scared. Michael and Ryan waited for the soldiers to leave. They followed them until Michael and Ryan entered the Interstate 8 freeway westbound towards San Diego. The troop movement paralleled the freeway for a good while, and Michael and Ryan drove slightly and slowly behind to observe. The troop movement was on State 80, Evan Hughes Highway, which, oddly, when viewed on Google Maps, just peters out at the base of a sand and rock hillside. We've probably followed them for four or five miles before we literally saw these things drive into the side of a mountain. I mean, very clearly. I mean, within a few hundred yards, we could see them just disappear into this mountain. And, uh, I mean, we watched the taillights go, everything. And uh, we stopped the car real quick and just, like, and basically just stared at the side of a mountain and we couldn't figure it out. I mean, from our point of view, we could see everything and we clearly watched these things just drive into this thing and disappear. Now, when you say they went into a mountain, you are literally saying there was no hole into the mountain and they just dematerialized into the side of hard sand and rock? That's what we saw. But, I mean, we're talking about a distance of maybe two to three hundred yards and you know, you see a vehicle, uh, you know, I'm looking down the street now, I could see my neighbor's car clear as day, and it would almost be like it just drove into the house without the garage door opening, almost like through a, like a hologram or something, you know, I, I, I have no idea. We looked at each other, and I basically said, did those things just disappear into the mountain? And Ryan just nodded his head and said, yeah. And uh, I said, where? And he's like, I have no idea. I said, is there a hole? And he's like, no. I was like, is there a tunnel or a bridge or something? And he's like, no. He's like, we just saw what we just saw. I mean, what, how much clearer could it be? After that, we sat there for about a minute and stared at each other. I was really freaked out. I had basically told Ryan, you know, whatever we just saw, no one's ever going to believe us. And this is nothing but the truth and the whole truth. So help me God. I knew something was very wrong, and I can never wrap my mind around it. And I'll probably never be able to figure it out, really. Is this just one man's fantastical tale? No. I was able to talk with his travel companion that day. This is what Ryan remembered. I don't know what they were. I mean, it looked, something was off, something wasn't right. It definitely has sat in my mind ever since that day. They all looked exactly the same. They were all the same color, real weird looking. He claims that you guys saw that convoy disappear into a hill. Tell me about that. Yeah, they were driving out towards the mountains. They just completely just disappeared. They just drove straight out and just gone. I think I remember off the top of my head, we just turned the radio off and just kind of sat in silence for a little while and then talked to each other about it, just kind of like, what the hell was all that? And I kind of tried to put it past me and forget about it. So Michael's accounting is a, a true accounting as best as you both can recall. Correct. Now Michael has had UFO experiences. So what do we make of these high strangeness events that seem to ride on the coattails of UFO experiencers? Does it somehow help inform us of the totality of the experience humans are undergoing? Or are these simple outliers? If events such as this seem connected to UFO experiencers, is this a clue of some sort? 
a connecting nexus that should be part of the discussion and research? Of course, there are varying opinions on this issue. Here are the thoughts of UFO expert Jacques Vallée. Quote, The fact is, the UFO phenomenon exists. It has been with us throughout history. It is physical in nature, and it remains unexplained in terms of contemporary science. It represents a level of consciousness that we have not yet recognized, and which is able to manipulate dimensions beyond time and space as we understand them. End quote. I say, perhaps the high strangeness events connected to UFO experiencers are simply another part of the same beast we're blindly grabbing at. This is an API case file. Case file. Next, a conversation between two skeptics, both of whom have had some second thoughts about whether conventional skeptical wisdom should in itself be the object of critical examination. As the late physicist Richard Feynman famously said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Do skeptics take this sage advice seriously enough? Is there reason to think that it's just possible that the UFO phenomenon should be taken seriously by science? One of the skeptics in this conversation is our own Paul Carr, and the second, whom Paul met online on a UFO forum, prefers to remain anonymous. What follows is an edited version of their conversation, part one, recorded in February of this year. It seems like we both seem to sort of stand just outside of organized skepticism. And we, we consider ourselves skeptics, but we're not quite in tune with all the skeptical dogma. Yeah. You found five issues or, or points about modern skepticism versus the UFO phenomenon that were troubling you that you've been thinking about. Uh, what, really, what really kicked that off? What started that? Well, first of all, I... I, I do have uh, involvement in um, organized skepticism. I was actually co-founder of a, a nationwide skeptic group. My involvement with that was a very formative kind of experience in, in terms of how I see the world. When you're involved with the skeptic movement, it's probably safe to say that you're, you're steeped in a certain discourse, a certain literature. You know, that's you know, Skeptical Inquirer magazine, Skeptic magazine, you know, uh, reading philosophy, you can see yourself with, you know, the, the demarcation in science, you know, what is science and what is pseudoscience and psychological bias, uh, logical fallacies, all those things are, are part of that um, mix. So it was a surprise to me <laughs> to, to find out that I may have done sort of a, maybe not quite a 180, but maybe we'll just say the 170 on this whole UFO question. I'm not sure if it has great significance, but I, I do have a pilot's license. I only have 100 some hours, but as I was working on that and I was logging my hours, I was quite consciously, at the time, was very much a skeptic about the whole UFO question and was very consciously um, sort of posing questions to myself as I was in the air about the possibilities for uh, misperception, misidentification, and how the sky being a really kind of different, different visual environment compared to the one that we were, you know, evolutionarily adapted to might lead you to make mistakes about judgment. So that's a little bit of my background, I guess. I, I mean, I think you and I would agree that the skeptic movement's done a lot of good. Yeah. And it's a, uh, a movement that's a, a lot of people were looking for a group to join. A lot of yeah. really smart people who felt left out of the conversation quite often when things turned to the woo-woo topics. So it's given people a home. It's also given people a way to take on some quite dangerous ideas. Uh, yeah. Things like alternative medicine and, and uh, re repressed memories, that sort of thing. And, and I think we can make a long list of, of harmful ideas that the skeptical movement has taken on. 
But you mentioned that you thought that they shouldn't tar everything with the same brush. Yeah. You know, you, since UFOs are, are not accepted by mainstream science, they for, for are out. Yeah, I, it seems to me, and I, I was only able to realize this in, in this sort of process of transition from what I now think is a kind of dogmatic skepticism to something that's more self-critical, more open-minded, that there's a kind of labeling um, master category fallacy that goes on where once you assign the label of the paranormal or woo or something like that, that sort of alerts the skeptic to the presence of something that's highly questionable and that there's really probably nothing inherently real or genuine there. And the the only task of the skeptic is to figure out how it is that people are accepting any of that to begin with. The distinction that I came to make with UFOs was that whereas with, um, let's say, certain claims about religion or um, ghosts, uh, alternative medicine, you know, is one you brought up. With UFOs, um, it seems to me that there's no theoretical reason why, let's say, ET originated entities, craft, couldn't be here. If you accept that uh, evolution is a process that's built into the fabric of reality and that it's, you know, very likely taking place on other um, planets, you know, in the um, uh, universe. And that if we sort of lowball the number of planets in our own galaxy that may have um, intelligent species, let's say a really low number, let's say 5,000. And if half of them are uh, at a stage uh, lower than us um, in terms of, you know, overall cultural, technical, scientific development and understanding, um, but half are higher, then it would seem through suppose that some of them might be, you know, 10,000 years ahead of us on a kind of hypothetical human-like technological trajectory, maybe 100,000 years, maybe a million. If that's the case, then is it so far-fetched to imagine that these civilizations might have learned a few more things about physics than we have, or have been puzzling over the the problem of um, interstellar traveler and may have a few more solutions than we've been able to imagine so far. So I understand the the skeptical objection to that, which is that these are great distances. Um, biological beings don't do too well in you know radiation intense environments. Um, there has to be a strong motivation uh, to traverse the distances uh, involved, especially if you can't get there quickly. Um, there, there's an argument to be made for that, but at the same time, I don't think it's a definitive one. But my point being that theoretically, I don't see the the great difficulty in terms of you know there being you know ETs um, here already. Um, I don't think that's a huge stumbling block. Now I'm not sure I, I, where I came to that um, sort of position. I think it was just all part of the transition I was making intellectually about this uh, question, sort of turning skepticism back on itself. We don't want to let the UFO true believers off too lightly here. I mean, they've done yeah. an awful lot to bring ridicule down on the subject themselves. But where is the dividing line? I mean, sometime in the 1950s or 60s, I think maybe it was with uh, Donald Menzel, the sort of official skeptical mainstream scientific position began came that this was all a bunch of nonsense. And, and then the Condon report came out in 67, and, and really the introduction to the Condon report was what everybody paid attention to, in which Condon said there's no scientific interest here. Do you think that that's what's behind the sort of organized skepticism's rejection of any meaningful study of UFOs, or is it? I think that does a lot, that initial kind of official culture, official science skepticism, um, that has done a lot to... Um, render the category of uh, ufology, you know, pretty much immune to, you know, open-ended uh, investigation. I think another thing that can't be ignored, and this is just my, um, I'm, I'm way too young to have lived, you know, during the 1950s, but it's my read on the, the culture of the time that when you combine the, the scientific authority uh, at the time with what I'm, I have to assume were significantly higher levels of just authoritarianism in the culture in general, it would be really easy to see how 
even in a discipline like science, which has some components of self-criticism, obviously, and, and open-ended pursuit of truth, you could see that even so, given the right kinds of you know, structures of prestige and authority and control and hierarchy, that once sort of the word came down from on high, from Harvard and other, other elite institutions um, and scientists, that everyone would fall into place. Can we talk a little more about your 170? We, I think we agree that the UFO culture, the UFO subculture, is full of lots of stuff that's highly questionable. Yeah. So you're not saying, oh, I've not become a true believer, but you're standing just outside that dogmatic skepticism, and you've, and you've come to a different point of view, but you're still a skeptic. So can you kind of give us the nuances of that? Yeah. This is still a process that's, uh, that's underway. The answer I give you right now would be different the one, than the one I might have given, let's say, three months ago. I think my position is that the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, is more likely to explain the data in some cases, you know, than misperception, misjudgment, you know, mismemory. As part of this transition, I've realized that the position of agnostic also um, encompassed a kind of psychological uh, security that skepticism did, because with, of course, skepticism, you have backup validation from, you know, other scientists, other skeptics, official culture, the media, and so forth. And, you know, everyone wants to, um, you know, be seen as, you know, reasonable and intelligent and educated. And so when you align yourself with that, you're not taking any chances. It's a very safe thing to be a skeptic with this uh, question. Agnosticism is also uh, fairly easy as well, although to get to the point where you're really on the fence about that, I think, also requires uh, a good amount of unlearning of um, um, certain biases and maybe even some dogmatism that you've um, picked up from the culture. But to sort of swing your leg over the fence and maybe even contemplate uh, standing on the other side of it, that's that's a very unsettling place. And I guess I realized that that psychological element was something that was um, extra rational, that wasn't a rational consideration, and that was perhaps preventing me from, well, I think it was preventing me from seeing some of these cases for what I, what I think they seem to be, which is, you know, that the ETH is the best uh, explanation for them. But at the same time, I, I sort of arrived at that position. I'm asking myself, well, if that's the case, could it be that there is a, is a kind of more subtle in systemic error that I'm making at this point? And if so, what is that? And I, if there is such a thing, I haven't been able to put my finger on, finger on it quite yet. The scientific evidence trap. Can you explain what the scientific evidence, in quotes, trap is? The, the scientific evidence trap very simply um, excludes uh, eyewitness testimony. And it excludes it for a couple of good reasons. People can misperceive things. They may have uh, an anticipation of what might uh, be up in the sky, and that may color what they see. Human memory is notoriously uh, fallible, even within a relatively short time of something. Um, you can have a group of people who are witness to the same event, and you'll have different reports afterwards. I guess that's more of a uh, perception, maybe perception slash memory problem. So there are good reasons to hold eyewitness testimony in some degree of doubt, to sort of put it into the uh, category of agnosticism with regard to a particular uh, truth claim. However, what, what seems to be happening within skepticism is skeptics seem to be establishing almost like a hidden demarcation between everyday observational evidence and even the kind of observational evidence that scientists might be producing you know, in a whatever setting that they work in and the kind of observational evidence that obtains uh, when people are seeing a UFO. But the, the scientific trap would seem to be to suggest that once you start looking at something in the paranormal, then um, suddenly what would normally be maybe a more reliable or trustworthy kind of, you know, just everyday observational report becomes incredibly suspect. And it sort of gives a green light for the, the skeptic to be doubting everything that's happened and even be interpolating or importing alternative explanations that even contradict what people who have reported things, you know, uh, reported. 
So the scientific trap, again, I think this construct that I'm proposing is in many other contexts, uh, observational evidence would be given a kind of uh, credence, the kinds of uh, evidential quality that we might see in some UFO reports might certainly pass muster in a court of law. But science, in this particular understanding of what science is, um, artificial excludes the, the validity, the seriousness of um, eyewitness testimony if it has to do with UFOs. There, there are people like myself and, and my team that are engaged in volunteer field investigation. We don't get paid. People have been doing field investigation for, oh, 50, 60 years now. We've collected large numbers of eyewitness reports and a very, very small amount of physical evidence, almost none. There's perhaps a handful of photographs that might be corroborate the witness story. Right. Um, there, there's not a whole lot. Should we be heading in a different direction as researchers? Or are we barking up the wrong tree doing field investigation? Oh, geez, that's a good question. Or is there something else we should be looking at? If we approach this as a, a process that I think uh, is going to be with us and should be with us for the long term, because I think there, I think there is something of genuine interest here, then I think we have to take a um, sort of systemic look at everything that's feeding into the possibility of this being treated seriously or otherwise. Um, I think there need, need to be voices who are um, being quite a bit more uh, critical of a lot of the, 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 the woo and the crazy you know, that's in the field. Because that, that functions, um, and it certainly did for me for a very long time. And I, I was under the impression I was being, you know, very open minded and reasonable about this topic. And I think largely I was, but when you hear story after story of the most outlandish claims and people misidentifying, identifying Venus for something or people not knowing what an aircraft looks like at night, et cetera, you, you really get turned off by it. You don't even want to go there. It's something you feel you're going to be you know, tarnished with if, if you do so, because you're going to be laboring in the company of, of people who don't have any kind of intellectual standards. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. One thing I, I think would be useful, and if, if this is out there on the, the internet, I guess I maybe I haven't looked hard enough for it, but um, and I know other people have proposed this as well. I think Jacques Vallée maybe has talked about this, but a kind of database of things we can um, exclude piece of space debris coming in or an airplane that's windmilling its rotor and the engine is turned off and therefore silent and sort of spooky at a distance. Well, right. And of course, our whole podcast is about that. But we were continuing with the field investigations, not because we expect to find a smoking gun case, but we're, we're looking for patterns. Then another thing that I think is very important is we need to we need to understand just what is, are the properties of eyewitness testimony, particularly when people see something that they've never seen before in their life. There's been a lot of research into that in the criminal justice field, uh, which I think might apply to some extent. But And a lot of it's not good news. I mean, a lot of it is people misidentify murder suspects and rapists on a pretty regular basis. My own sense is that we, we have, we've really just started. And Antonio and I have used the phrase draining the swamp. Mm -hmm. The ufology is a bit of a swamp right now. We're going to drain it <laughs> uh, and <laughs> clean it up. And part of it is getting rid of, of all the parochial camps that start come to exist for their own sake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, little organizations. And they don't want to share data, and they don't want really to participate in a scientific enterprise. They, they're they more about confirmation bias. Yeah. A lot of it's education, teaching people not only about identified flying objects, which, which as you know, pointed out, there are many, many categories of that. Uh, and that's one thing Antonio has been big on is is – educating people about drones and lens flares and astronomical events and so on that are often mistaken and still are mistaken. It seems like we've really just made no progress at all in educating the public on those things. So, you know, we're just kind of used to the fact that we get 85 to 90 percent. Yeah. Not really hoaxes, just just people misunderstanding what they've seen. And we're triaging cases since we have only a few field investigators who are trained and we only have uh, and none of us are getting paid, so we all have to do other things with our, with our day. We only take a few cases, and we only take the very best cases we can. But one thing I want to do is study not just the purported object in the sky, but study the witness themselves. Mm -hmm. What kind of person reports a UFO versus what kind of person doesn't? 
what kind of things might they misperceive or correctly perceive? How, how, how much can we rely on memory and how, and how long ago? How does memory deteriorate over time? I mean, I had one case where a guy reported something that seemed really, really anomalous. But it was something that 10 years ago, he had never written any of it down. And it certainly seemed like a really, really weird thing that he saw. But if he misremembered a couple of details, then it probably was a fairly ordinary event. We're not taking 10-year-old cases anymore, partly for that reason. Yeah. I think that's something that, I, in, that I'm really going to emphasize with people is let's, in addition to asking to report UFOs, let's collect some data about why they reported it and what sort of what was going through their heads when they decided to report it to us. And are they concerned about social repercussions of reporting it and so on? Uh, collect that data. Those, that's, those are things we can really study scientifically. Separate out the phenomenon from the reporting of the phenomenon, then maybe we'll, we'll have much more accurate data. We can really ask, ask scientific questions about, you know, when somebody sees something they don't understand what motivates them to take certain actions. And I've seen everything from people saying, I'm never talking about this again, to life-changing and they become investigators. What I'm suggesting is that we attack the parts that we can handle scientifically. I'm not sure we can handle ET scientifically yet. It's, right. it's almost like being being in, in the 17th century and, and being asked to study electrons. Well, they were sort of starting to study electrical phenomena, but they had no idea what electrons were. Yeah. They were two centuries away from that. Not only do we not have good theory, we don't even know how to, how to create one. So let's study the things we can study. Let's study what we're not so much studying a phenomenon, we're studying our perception of it. The history of it is that that, that leads to mature science. And it took a very long time, but it, it can, that's, I think that's where we are. I think you're right. I mean, if, if we don't have something in hand, you know, that we can manipulate and test, then we rely upon inference making and, uh, you know, hypothesis. But uh, even that can be sort of uh, dicey. It's hard to I come mean, up with a hypothesis I, I, when you don't have, <laughs> you don't have a theory. Join us for part two of Paul Carr's conversation with a skeptic on next month's episode. Next up, we hear from API's founder and director, Antonio Paris. He has just finished writing his second book called Space Science, and I had a chance to talk with him about it. It really goes back to uh, the first book. You know, the first book, Aerial Phenomena, was about what are UFO investigations? You know, what, what are the processes we use? And, uh, you know, a, a little hint of what are the type of cases that we investigated. And, and then I just talked a little bit about the, what, what, uh, what's involved in the UFO community. So, you know, I always wanted to write the second book, Space Science. And it really came down to what I've been listening to, kind of the side chatter, or the uh, water cooler talk that I hear at UFO conferences. The one argument that I continuously listen at UFO conferences is that, well, the universe is big, so there has to be life out there. We can't be the only ones. And I always step back and I, I say to myself, yes, the universe is big out there. Maybe there should be life out there, not must. And people, people when, they, when they envision that the universe is big, that there must be life out there, then they throw in the second parameter, and that second parameter is that, well, since there, there is life out there, they must be millions of years in advance of us, so therefore they travel here, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what the oldest UFO phenomena is. Well, that argument is really kind of silly. And about a year and a half ago, I said to myself, I would like to write a book about, you know, how big is the universe? I wanted to concentrate on interstellar travel the distances between some of these stars that are allegedly uh, the homes of some extraterrestrials. I wanted to talk about planetary formations and the, the processes involved for the minimum requirements for, for uh, basic life, you know, basic complex life. We're not even talking about intelligent life, and then you have intelligent life capable of technology, and then you have intelligent life capable of interstellar travel. So the numbers uh, kind of get smaller and smaller and smaller as you add in all these parameters. 
So that's kind of like what half of the book is about. And then the other half of the book talks about what are the minimum requirements, at least from a human perspective, to uh, carry out interstellar travel. You know, from a, a gravitational biology perspective, a space physiology perspective, all the things that are involved for, for manned space flight, uh, those things also got to affect alleged extraterrestrials. You know, if, if, if extraterrestrials uh, are getting on some spacecraft and they're traveling wherever, you know, and they're getting here, then it is assumed that they must know about space physics. They must know about interstellar travel. Uh, and all the other things that are in space that affect us, radiation, micrometeors, uh, time dilation, the twins paradox, uh, energy requirements for interstellar travel. Well, those things got to also affect the, the, uh, the alleged extraterrestrials. So, you know, when you get the typical people like myself that stand up and say, well, how did they get here? Or, or, or what type of propulsion sensor they're using? Or what about time dilation? You know, or what, what's, what's the type of energy requirements they're using? You, you usually hear crickets, you know, they don't like to answer those questions. But then I, you know, because I, as a, I guess as a ufologist, you know, I don't even know if that's an actual occupation, but I guess somebody interested in UFOs, I do in a last chapter, it was called Challenges for the uh, UFO Community. It's kind of a, my analysis of what I've seen in the last two years. It, you know, I, I kind of put that in the first book, all the nonsense that you see at UFO conferences, but now I threw in a little more. Some of the pseudoscience that that's it's that's kind of what UFO the study of UFOs has become because now you hear it you hear metaphysics you hear astral projection. So you've always really been a proponent of of doing investigations as a nuts and bolts guy, and you've had difficulty with uh, so much of the the attending circus around the question of of space travel by other than us, that this kind of made you dig the other direction and say, now, wait a minute, people, let's ask a few questions here. Exactly. One of the things I really hate about what you, ufology is masquerading as, it's a science, but it's not. But I think that the main purpose of the book, it's not to debunk the study of UFOs or to debunk, uh, you know, investigators or, or cases or et cetera. My main goal for the book is to shape and force the UFO community to come up with better arguments for their hypothesis that some of these UFOs are extraterrestrial. There are good cases out there. There are a few that are, that are really exciting. But, you know, you, you mentioned the word a few seconds ago. It has become a circus. There are a good handful of conferences. Let me tell you that. Well, now let's go back to the thing about, you know, standing around the water cooler and hearing the, the, um, the typical enjoiner. Well, there must be UFOs because the universe is so big. Now, in defense of that, Antonio, the Fermi paradox was not saying that there isn't because things are so big. He was saying, from what I interpret, that there should be. Why aren't we seeing them? Every indication is they are out there. Why can't we find them? And even the Drake equation was exceedingly scrupulously conservative when it put together the the equation to say how many planets are out there that should hold yeah. some type of being. So putting those two things together, that some of the greatest minds of our day are saying, yeah. there really needs to be something out well, there. Well, Why don't we see them? And, and that's a great point. In the book, I write that the Drake equation itself continues to evolve. So even the Drake equation from, you know, 50 years ago is really no longer valid because the numbers of extra extrasolar planets that we find in today because of the Kepler mission, et cetera, are changing those numbers. But what we're learning today, which we didn't know 50, 60 years ago when Fermi you know, came up with his uh, paradox and the Drake equation came out, is that you know, habitable planets and extrasolar planets, as many as abundant they might be out there, it's really the parent star, the system that it, that it rotates around, evolves. That's the key indicator for life. And I think that's what we... We're really we're focusing on that. And let me give you an example. Say the, the Zeta Reticuli system, you know, 56 years ago, we really had no, no indication of what was out there. Uh, we knew it was, you know, a binary star system. Um, we didn't have the, the capabilities to detect planets at the time. Uh, it's a fairly relatively close system, not that far. Uh, I think it's 38 light years or something 
close to that. So there was all type of speculation that while it's close enough, it's 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 a it's a sun like star like ours. Uh, so there has to be planets out there. So yes, the grays come from there. Now we know for certainty that there are no planets out there. Um, that we know that the the uh, Zeta one, Zeta two are not capable of hosting any type of extrasolar planets. So the equations and the arguments for, for, from 60, 70 years ago, including Drake and and Fermi, those are also evolved. You know, uh, you know when you jump forward 50 years now. And then we're also learning that 50, 60 years ago, we didn't know the real substance of what the Milky Way has, you know, the types of solar systems and stars in the the Milky Way. Today we're learning that a lot of these are red dwarf stars, and a lot of these red dwarf stars are are relatively way too young to have habitable planets. Those are not capable of hosting, as far as I know, and as far as the uh, NASA community understands, they're not capable of hosting uh, habitable planets. Now, now let me play devil's advocate here. We're talking about sure. how how science, of course, is is leaps and bounds, learning yeah. all the time, brand new stuff, and and that brings, of course, into the discussion here, higher physics, things that are being learned every day in the labs. That that fifty years ago, you just there was no way you even thought about that. Now, here we are trying to wrap our mind around, you know, the double split experiment and the sure. fact that they've proven there are multiple possibilities at every point in time. And so that would make some thinking people who tend to believe that there is some type of phenomenon interacting with us, it would make them think, you know, we just don't know yet, but there is something. We're just too stupid at this point to know what it is. That is a possibility, and 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 I will entertain that, that that hypothesis. But the book Space Science is about what we know now, what facts. I don't like to talk about. I don't like to speculate about what can be. So I I, I kind of hinted that a little bit in the last chapter of the book, and I and I write that we have to be careful with speculating too much. I'm not saying extraterrestrials don't exist. I'm not saying extraterrestrials are not visiting us. Perhaps they are. But for a a being that looks like a human getting in a metallic craft and and whisking away through interstellar space wherever they're coming from and then finding us, they happen to find us. So what I'm asking for is the UFO community to come up with a better argument than someone getting in a spacecraft, you know, and their family going on a tour to Earth and then sometimes crashing here. That's not the way it works. I prefer. And that might be my third book. I prefer to to entertain the arguments. Are they harnessing the the power of light to get here? You know, in some fashion. Or is it interdimensional? Um, were they already here millions and millions of years ago, and they're still here? Those arguments are more defendable. You know that that do- kind of is the the. Um- idea put forth by Jacques Vallée that he says, yeah. let's stop and take a look at this now because uh, we might be coming at this from a wrong angle. The phenomenon, this enigmatic phenomenon exists, but yeah, maybe we aren't looking at the right place. Maybe we should be looking here instead of there. No, I completely agree with you, Marsha. That's why the objective of the book is, you know, I want better arguments for the hypo- for you know this hypothesis. I don't think we have a good one right now. That was API's founder and director, Antonio Paris, author of two books now. He was speaking about his latest, Space Science, which is just now going on sale. You can purchase a copy through the API website or, better yet, attend the Ozark UFO Conference in Arkansas April 12th and get an autographed copy. This is API Case Files. Case Files. Next on the venue is Paul Carr with his third installment of Unidentified Science. I'm starting off this series by talking about four virtues I think we are going to have to live by if the study of UFOs is ever going to be accepted as a science. Humility, patience, integrity, and skepticism. This one is a little bit about skepticism, but mostly about patience. 
there is a big problem in unidentified aerial phenomena research that needs to be addressed before we can make any claim of being a scientific enterprise. We are going to need a lot of patience to solve it. The problem is that much, in fact, nearly all, of our database is eyewitness testimony. While our research has kept pretty much the same approach as always, science has marched on, and this includes the study of human perception and memory. One assumption we make is that human perception is transparent and that we can accurately assess unfamiliar things primarily with our vision. We think we see a thing directly, but in fact, we know that layers of complex brain processes intervene to create and update the phenomenal world model in our minds. I remember once beachcombing with someone in Florida. We were looking for shark's teeth. She was finding them all around, and I was failing. It's not that her eyesight was sharper. As soon as she pointed them out, I could see them easily. It was simply that her brain spotted the little dark anomalies in the sand while mine just smoothed right over them. Often what we think we are seeing, we aren't seeing at all, but our brains present it to us as if we were. When viewing unfamiliar objects, possibly in unfamiliar environments, the brain will do its best to fit it into our world model. And this won't work the same for everyone. We have assumed that human memory is a kind of recording device, and if someone is certain enough of their recall and feels the memory vividly enough, then it must be mostly accurate. This is the naive tape recorder model of memory. There may be some noise in the recording, but underlying that is an accurate impression of actual events. We now know that the tape recorder model is wrong. The accuracy of a memory is not related to the certainty of the rememberer or the vividness of the memory. In fact, memories are constructed, not played back. Most of this construction process is transparent to us, so we're not even aware of it. Often this memory construction process fails in many ways gross and subtle, resulting in not only inaccuracies but outright confabulations, the well-documented phenomenon of false memory. People with false memories aren't liars or lunatics. They simply tripped over yet another bug in the way our brains function. The assumption that vivid memories must be true, coupled with unethical practices by therapists, has led to more than one tragic accusation of abuse that has destroyed innocent lives and families. Some of these cases are documented in the recent book by Aronson and Tavris. Mistakes were made, but not by me. And also explains why, when confronted with evidence to the contrary, people will not admit that they were wrong. Therapists won't admit their methods were deeply flawed, and their patients won't admit that their memories were wrong or even completely fabricated. A key book for those with a stake in human memory, all of us as far as I can determine, is Harvard professor Daniel Schachter's Seven Sins of Memory. This book provides a framework for understanding how our memories can let us down or fool us. Of particular interest to UFO researchers are sins four through six, misattribution, suggestibility, and bias. For example, Schachter recounts the story of the manhunt for John Doe No. 2 from the Oklahoma City bombing case, who turned out to be not a suspect at all, but someone who had rented a van a day earlier than Timothy McVeigh. A mechanic's memory had placed him in McVeigh's company. That sort of misattribution is common, as are memories shaped or even created by suggestion and bias. Now, I'm not telling you that your mind is impotent. It's not that human memory and perception don't work at all. Of course they do, and often amazingly well. In fact, our brains include better feature and pattern detection equipment than any technology can currently create. It's just that we ape descendants aren't, by ourselves, very good scientific instruments. We need help to make observations that work as actual evidence. Eyewitness testimony relies on both perception and memory. Many scientists now flatly refuse to accept any eyewitness testimony as evidence because of the known problems. I support an approach that accounts for eyewitness testimony. 
exploiting the strengths of human perception for feature extraction, but requiring rapid documentation and corroborating evidence. Since genuine UFOs are such fleeting, rare, usually distant and non-repeating phenomena, getting scientific instruments that can perform detailed observations deployed in time is unlikely, at least until we understand the phenomena much better than we do. This is where patience comes in. We receive many UFO cases that involve a single eyewitness from an event that occurred months or even years ago and with no corroboration. Our searches for corroboration nearly always come up empty. That is why investigators need to focus their attention on cases where witness corroboration is available, or at least possible. This corroboration could take the form of physical evidence, but that is rare. More likely, it will come from other witnesses. If you see a UFO, please bring it to the attention of everyone around you while you are fumbling for your camera. Whether you manage to get a good video or not, please write down your experience and make a sketch of what you saw at each phase of the sighting immediately afterward, before you talk to any other witnesses about the details. Then, please don't be afraid to report it to a responsible organization, one that may actually investigate while protecting your anonymity, not just file it away. It is certainly fine to report your sighting to more than one group. We should be sharing information in an ethical way that protects witnesses, but allows us to look for patterns across the entire data set. It's not any one sighting, but those patterns that will help us in our search for understanding and ultimately mature science. In the next Unidentified Science, I will take a break from all this sermonizing about virtue for a little fun and speculation. What if, in fact, we are dealing with phenomena that are smarter than we are? Does that mean all bets are off? Let's think about that together. Please join us on Google Plus or Reddit, and let's move the discussion forward. I'm always happy to answer questions and hear your views. That was Paul Carr, API's Deputy Director, with his third installment of Unidentified Science. Now, our 20-second recommendations from the API team. Paul, let's start with you. My recommendation is another book this time, Tricks of the Mind, by Master Illusionist Darren Brown. This book covers a lot of ground from really useful memory tricks to hypnosis to paranormal belief. Real insight on every page folds into one major theme. How can we be fooled and how can we fool ourselves? We need to know more about that. Hi, this is Lawrence McNeil. I'd recommend that everyone takes a look at Grant Cameron's website, which is www.presidentialufo.com. Grant is definitely one of my favourite UFO researchers and he takes a fascinating look at the connection between UFOs and all of the US presidents from Franklin D. Roosevelt all the way through to Reagan, Bush and Obama. And Antonio Paris. My 20 recommendation is to check out the website heavensabove.com. This is a pretty good website, um, in particular if you are trying to determine whether or not the object you saw at night was a satellite or not, you can actually go into this website and uh, plug in a few key parameters, which is your date, time, and the cardinal direction of the object that you saw, and the website will let you know whether or not it was actually a satellite. Again, that's heavens-above.com. My 22nd recommendation is to Google and read all you can about Jacques Vallée. He's a computer scientist and mathematician who has been studying ufology for many years. What I like about him is that his take on the phenomena evolves over time as he gathers more insight and data. He's not dogmatic. Rather, he's dynamic. Jacques Vallée, J-A-C-Q-U-E-S-V-A-L-L-E-E. -E. I'm Nancy Doty. My recommendation is to be sure to contact API when you see something that you know is not believable. Look around. See if there's another witness that can support your sighting. Then 
walk over and say, hey, did you see that? What was that? And just start a conversation. Maybe there's a third person. Or if there's no one, report it anyway. Maybe they didn't see it immediately. There's no one there. Maybe the person in the next block saw something. Now, Nancy, while we're talking here, you just got a new case, 030. Now, that happens to be in this area. And what I find interesting about that case right off the top is somebody who works in a a very highly respected, well-known aerospace industry here in the Washington, Maryland area reported a sighting right there at the workplace. Absolutely correct. She was in the parking lot. She heard geese. She looked up to see, I guess, to see the geese, and she saw two round objects. And what is so interesting, one appeared to be tumbling. The witness was contacted, and I'm going to start the investigation immediately because, as you said, this is a very well-respected agency in the D.C. Maryland area. Yeah. In fact, I recall she said that she is trained to identify things. That's true. And when we have a witness like that, that is trained, those are the best witnesses of all. They're trained. It is quite interesting. I'm excited to get this case. Yeah, yeah. What I want to find out first off is when you track uh, Weather Underground and see if those objects were going opposite of how the the wind was flowing, then you got maybe something a little more to uh, sink your teeth into. Absolutely. That's different. Yeah. All right. Well, you go hunt and see what that one brings up and report back to us, okay? Will do. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. This is an API case file. Case files. Well, folks, that's a wrap for API Case Files Episode 3. Let me remind you that there are a lot of upcoming events you may wish to attend. They're too numerous to mention here, but please check out the Events tab at our website, www.aerialphenomenon.org. And if you want to report a UFO, you can find the report form at our website. Thanks to all who contributed to this episode, named within the podcast and unnamed for personal reasons. Hey, if you want to drop us a line, that would be great. We can read your letters on the show. We always appreciate content and input. By the way, the next episode of API Case Files should be out late April or May with more cases, more interviews, and hopefully some interesting input from you, our listeners. Links in the show notes for this episode three can be found at apicasefiles.libsyn.com. All music heard on this webcast is licensed under Creative Commons. If you're interested, the Case Files opening theme is a mashup of Totality Music's Time Surfer and Cat Fox Games' B3. Segment 1, the latest Case Files report, was Agnes by Rod Hamilton. Segment 2, Plastic Soldiers, featured the music Missing Time by Totality Music. Segment 3, Conversations with a Skeptic, used Stellar Drone's Eternity. Music during the outro of Segment 4, which was the interview with Antonio Paris, was by Candle Gravity, the cut Tommy's Bubbles. Segment 5, Paul Carr's Unidentified Science, used All India Radio's instrumental Persist. Segment 6, API Investigator's Recommendations, featured Gillicuddy's Adventure Darling. And our closing theme is a jaunty piece called Check Your Math by DJ Spooky. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for their creative spirit and open hearts. This has been API Case Files Episode 3. The podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomena Investigations. Episode 3 was produced by Marsha Barnhart with help from Paul Carr and Antonio Paris. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. This is your host, Marsha Barnhart. We hope you join us again on API Case Files.
This is API Case Files. Case Files.